with no further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Maggie Hunts. Help me thank Karen McCullough. <laughs> the best is yet to come, and I'll tell you why. You'll feel alert and young when your sugar's not high. If you ignore and pretend it's not there, it can give you all kinds of woes. But if you bring your sugar down, then you'll be back on your toes. The best is yet to come, and you'll really feel fine. The best is yet to come, come the day you'll shine. And you're gonna feel fine. This will not be boring, okay? You'll feel better and we'll all learn how to stay that way. Because, you know, we all get stressed out, whether you're dealing with diabetes or not. We've all got so many things on our minds. <laughs> in fact, think about anything going on in your head. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of noise? I've got a list. <laughs> These are the challenges that drive me crazy. And this was a very easy list to make. Let's see if how it compares with yours. Work, kids, health, work, kids, parents. <laughs> ah! What would our lives be like? If we didn't have those challenges, do you ever like to fantasize about that? I do. Like with diabetes, sometimes I just want to pretend it's not there. If I didn't have diabetes, I would never count my carbs. I would only eat in bakeries. I wouldn't watch my sugar. I'd eat Hagen dazs and Oreos, margaritas and Krispy Kreme. Oh, it's not fair how fast that goes down. If I didn't have diabetes, insulin would kick in automatically. No need to test and monitor the sugar in my blood. I would no longer look like a walking laboratory when I opened up my purse. I know I'd be a blimp if I ate like that. We all would, but it's a fantasy song. It's my fantasy. I got type one diabetes when I was 27 and I've had it for 28 years. Okay, so if you're doing the math, I'm 55. But wait. This is a part where you're supposed to gasp and you're supposed to shout in horror. No way. Let's try that again. Yeah, wait, here we go. I'm 55. No way. All right. Now you're talking. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have type 1? Type 2? Pre-diabetes? How about anyone who supports people who live with diabetes? That's everyone. I want you to know that you are not alone. There are 25.8 million people living with diabetes in the United States, and 7 million don't know they have it. They're undiagnosed. But that's not the really big number. The really big number is 79 million people have pre-diabetes. That's where your sugar's a little bit high, but not high enough to be diabetes yet. Okay, and so if you take that 79 million people with pre-diabetes, then you add that to the 26 million who already have diabetes. That's over 100 million people. And you might think, well, I don't know, my head can't even deal with numbers that big. How does that relate to me? Well, that's one-third the population in the United States. So you're like, okay, so that means one in three people in the U.S. are living with some form of diabetes. And most don't know it. So in this room of, let's say, 300, that's 100 people that would have diabetes. And it might be you, or it might be you, or it might be you, or you. Well, what do I do? How do I even know if I have it? You know, ah, 
we all get nervous. Like, I don't want to know about that. Welcome to the club. You might feel like my mom. My mom, Marsha Goodman. Oy, another doctor, another pill, another prescription I need to fill. Another season, another reason for making co-pays. Picture you schlep to doctors for sugar your eyes then feet. Picture you buy a good book. Now you can feel a beat. You're feeling better and more alert. Your sugar's even, you skip dessert. But don't forget, folks, that's what you get, folks, for making co-pays. Thank God for co-pays. Thank God for co-pays, co-pays. <laughs> and you know, there's all kinds of diabetes and you might want to know how in the world would you know you have it. Well, going to the doctor can be good news. Because if you find out early enough, you can feel better, right? So I have type 1 diabetes that used to be called juvenile diabetes. I think that still fits, actually, in my case. But anyway, and that's where you don't make insulin anymore. You automatically go on insulin from the first day, okay? Because all food turns into sugar in your body. And then you take insulin, and it brings it down. So you do manually what your body used to do automatically. Wham, your, your symptoms come on fast and hard. Okay, so you, they're really extreme. And when I was first diagnosed, I was 795. And normal blood sugar is 100, okay, just to kind of give you an idea. But with type 1, you might be between 300 and 800 when you're first diagnosed. But then there's type 2. And with type 2, your sugar could be between 250, 200, and 250. So your symptoms aren't as severe and it's easier to miss. So that's why we'll go through that today so everyone can know how well you're doing or how you can get help to feel better. And people with type two, they can go five to six years before they're diagnosed. So it's really key to find out soon and feel better. And with pre-diabetes, your sugar can be between 100 and 125. So you can imagine, you know, it's just, you're just a little bit having symptoms. So that's why it's so important to work with your medical team and find out where you are so that you can feel better. And if you need to bring your sugar down, you can do that, okay? Because you're not alone with all the people that are living with diabetes. So how do you know you have diabetes? That's a good question. I'd be wondering if that if I were you. Well, if you have high blood sugar, welcome to diabetes, okay? And... It depends. The higher your sugar, the more it, your symptoms might feel. But how do you even know if you have high blood sugar? I didn't know that. I had no idea. So what I'd like to do is to kind of tell you what the symptoms are. All right? If you've got a pen, you're all ready. Good for you. All right. The first symptom of living with diabetes or living with high blood sugar is that you're thirsty. And, you know, you might think, well, of course I'm thirsty. I live in Houston. Hello? Have you gone outside? Dr. Oz tells us to drink lots of water, and water's a really good thing. But when your sugar's 7.95, you're like crazy thirsty. I was so thirsty. I'd have sold my brother for an ice water. I was so thirsty. And then if you figure, okay, you're thirsty, what happens next? Well, then you gotta go to the restroom. I had to go to the restroom. And then I remember thinking, well, if I wasn't so thirsty, I wouldn't have to go to the restroom. These symptoms are so stupid. And one time I was with my daughter and she was about seven and I had to dart into a restroom so I went into the men's room. And she was like, mom! And I thought, well, it's better than how embarrassing it would have been, right? And I know for me, there was no line. So you gotta go where there's no line. So you think, okay, so you're drinking a lot, so then you're extra thirsty, then you're tired. You think, well, everybody's tired. Who's tired? Who's not tired? And, you know, for me, I thought it was such a cycle. The diabetes symptoms were driving me crazy because I thought, okay, I'm thirsty, then I'm going to the restroom. Well, if I could just sleep through the night and not have to get up and go to the restroom all the time, I wouldn't be tired. I thought, I can't go to a doctor with symptoms like that. And I was 7.95. So can you imagine if your blood sugar is like 200? You're, you may not even notice. 
You may just be a little bit extra thirsty or a little bit extra having to go to the restroom or a little bit extra tired. You know, hey, we all like a good afternoon nap. What do you get when your sugar's high? You get real thirsty and you gotta go. You want a nap because you move real slow. Go to the dock and get a test. Go to the dock and get a test. You may drink some goop. They'll take your blood. But then you'll know the score for sure. You're gonna feel better than you did before. Go to the dock and get a test. Go to the dock and get a test. That's like my passion. I want everyone to find out how good they can feel. Like Karen mentioned, let's all feel better. Because just like anything else, if we catch it early, we feel better. And I'll never forget what my doctor said when he was trying to describe diabetes to me. And he used a bakery metaphor. Can you believe it? A bakery metaphor. So I apologize if you get hungry. But he said, think of your organs like plain cake donuts. Okay. And he said, just imagine if you have extra sugar in your body, then your, your organs get glazed and goopy, just like it's a glazed donut. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's okay. And he said, and they don't work as well. Right? Because how is an organ going to work as well if it's coated in goopy sugar? And that's what happens. That's why there's long-term complications to having extra sugar in your body. You know, because then all of a sudden your, your liver doesn't work as well, your kidneys don't work as well, your brain doesn't work as well. There's a lot of things that don't work as well. And that's why the little bitty vessels in your body are the first ones affected by the complications. So it is, diabetes is the main, the leading cause of preventable blindness. But it's preventable. That's a really key word. Because we can find out and feel better. We don't have to have to have eye problems. And you could imagine the eyes got little bitty vessels. And if you bring your sugar down, it can make a big difference with impotence as well. There could be all kinds of wonderful benefits to bringing your sugar down. And did you know that more people are in the hospital with feet problems with diabetes than anything else? So don't do any home surgery because you don't want to have risk any blood and have an infection. Just go to the doctor. My doctor once said, he said, Maggie, imagine with diabetes, I want you to keep your blood sugar between 80 and 120. And I was a new patient. I went, okay, doc, no problem. I had no idea what I agreed to. So your blood sugar, right? Every time you eat food, it turns into sugar in your body and your sugar goes up. Depending on the amount you eat and what kind you eat depends that level, right? But then your body will automatically kick insulin in, your sugar comes down, gorgeous, right? But if you don't make insulin anymore or with type two, you don't make enough insulin anymore, then all of a sudden you've got to do manually what the body does. So Perfect blood sugar, if you remember, was 100, right? So if your sugar is low, that could be 70. So that means you have not enough food. That sounds like a great problem, but not when it happens. Not enough food and too much insulin, all right? And then you can fall off the balance beam by being too low. Or if we eat too much and we really eat a lot of potatoes and bread and, and pasta and things that really will pack the, bring our insulin up, then all of a sudden our sugar goes up. We fall off this balance beam because our sugar is too high. And that's when we start to have those complications again of being thirsty and needing to use the restroom. And there's one other symptom that I also want to mention, which is you can get cranky. Now, I used to think I was just naturally cranky, so what the heck. But what happens is, if your sugar... I remember coming home one day, and I was ripping everybody's head off. I was telling them what I thought of them, and it wasn't pretty. And my teenage daughter looked at me and said, Mom, you should check your sugar. And I thought, don't you just love the police? But I did, and I was 345, and she was right. So that's why it's so key. And the faster your sugar goes up, the harder it is to bring down. 
Okay, so that's why we want to catch it when it's just starting to go up or just starting to go down. It's the same thing. It's like perfect blood sugar. If he's saying you want to be between 80 and 120, that's 40 points. I can eat a piece of bread and it's 50 points that'll throw my sugar. And that's if I only have one. If it has a little friend with it, then all of a sudden I'm falling off the balance beam the other way. Now, doctors may open up what your range of sugar will be, so don't worry about that so that you feel successful. But to me, I just thought, oh, that is really challenging. How do I do that? How you feel if your sugar's high all depends on what level it is, right? Like you might be a little extra thirsty, then you're really crazy thirsty. You can also, when you're cranky, you can be depressed, sad. I mean, if you keep your sugar high over a long period of time, it's really extraordinary how our sugar affects our emotions. And I never knew that. I wish they told me when I first went to the doctor. I went 16 years without knowing that my blood sugar affected my emotions. And then <laughs> later, when I got my sugar in control, my sister said, yeah, no kidding. Like to everybody else, it was like completely obvious. People at Intel, when I worked there, they could look at my face and know where my sugar was. And if I, if I ever said she needs a snack, they're like, hey, get out of the way, get her food. Because they would see what would happen. And I'll never forget, I was coming back from a speech in Wisconsin, and I was talking to a security guard, and he was on a break, and we went from talking about bratwurst to um, diabetes. And, uh, you know, food, okay. And I told him that your emotions are affected by your blood sugar. And this big, burly man gave me the biggest, sweetest bear hug because he had been told he needed to see a shrink. And I said, well, you know what? You might need a shrink, but you definitely want to bring your sugar down also. And he was so relieved because we all feel guilty. That's what we do to ourselves. Whether you have diabetes or not, we all feel bad like it's our fault. You know, and I just want everyone to know that it's not your fault. So you might think, well, how does one get this? What are the causes of diabetes? Well, with type 1, we don't know. Type 2, there's three reasons that people get type 2 diabetes. One, you're getting older. Well, that's the good news. If you weren't getting older, you wouldn't be around. So, yay! The second reason genetics. And you know, our genetics make us who we are. And we can't change that. That would be very tricky. So you're getting older, genetics, and the third reason is obesity. But you know, that's not one person's problem. That's everyone's problem. That's our country's problem. We all know we're not supposed to get food through a window in our car. Cheap food is everywhere. We're all busy. I get it. It's not one person's fault. And so often with diabetes, we think everything is our fault. So often with our health, with our stress, with anything. And it's not. I want everyone to feel better. You know, that's, that's why I do this. I remember one of the first songs that came to me when I was singing about diabetes was, um, My blood sugar kept on rising up. The more I tried controlling it, the more it went berserk, nothing seemed to work. Hi, now I'm in control and I just feel so happy. My life is mine. No more wacko highs or lows. Oh, those were the worst now. My life is mine again. Now I am balanced and free nothing's worrying me <laughs> and you know it didn't always feel that way. Because you might be thinking, okay, so you told us a lot about how your sugar's high. What happens, what does a low blood sugar look like? Like, I don't think I want that. And that's why sometimes for people to feel better, you want to go on insulin so that you can feel better. Because you think if you're type two and it took you five years to discover you had it, sometimes it's a long-term complication that people get and then they discover that they've had diabetes and that's why they got that complication. 
So we want to really catch it early. Again, the doctor's the good news. So it's like, okay, if I go on insulin, I don't know if I want to do that. Like, I was afraid, and I needed to go on insulin that day. And so first, I was in the hospital. That's how long ago it was. You know, they put me in the hospital for a week. Can you imagine now you have a baby in the parking lot? But, you know, 28 years ago, they put you in the hospital. And um, they gave me the insulin at first, and I thought, okay. And then I remember the first time I had to give myself a shot. And I thought, Ugh. I told everybody I knew that I was going to do it, so I couldn't back out. So I told everybody, okay, Sunday at noon, I'm going to do it. <laughs> they said, okay, can't wait to hear. <laughs> so I'll never forget, Sunday at noon, I'm holding the syringe, my hands are shaking, and I'm going, okay. And I said over and over, this will save my life. This will save my life. This will save. That's it. It was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. And here, I'll share my, uh, my mother, Marsha Goodman, again. I'll give you a little Jewish mother-ism about fear. She says, you know, it's not the things you worry about that get you. It's the things you don't know are coming that pack the biggest wallop. What do you know? The older she gets, the wiser she becomes. I thought that was so great. I thought that was really marvelous. And I wanted to just show you with a syringe. I'm not going to pass this around just so you know, nobody gets poked. But I'm telling you, this is itsy bitsy itsy bit like half a, a fingernail. I mean, of a pinky. It is so little. And it just goes in fat. And I don't know about you, but that's not a problem for anybody. Right? You just lean over and... So it's really, really easy. What I want people to know, though, is that there are so many times that sometimes if you have a low blood sugar reaction, because that's what people are afraid of, you know, again, depends how low or how fast it's moving. Sometimes, you know, you're just a little like, I know for me, like my hands and my uh, lips might shake a little bit, or I'll cry. So anytime I cry, I test my blood sugar. So I'll be like talking to my husband, oh, no, hold on a second. And I'll go test. And 95% of the time, it's low. And then, there, so that's something that like a half a cup of juice can solve that like no problem. Zip, zip, you're back in shape. But again, just like if it's high, if it gets low and you don't know that's happening and you, it keeps going, then all of a sudden, I remember one time I was sitting at a party and I was in a stupor. And I heard this voice over in the corner say, Maggie, where's Kate? And I looked towards that voice and I said, who? And Kate was my four-year-old daughter. Now your teenager, that you might forget. <laughs> it might even be a favor. But your four-year-old, you remember. Took a little bit more juice and it took a lot longer. Then there are the times you really don't forget and that you really want to solve. And I'll never forget one time I was in the car. I was the chauffeur. Can anybody relate to that? The chauffeur for kids? So I'm the chauffeur and my daughter is behind me in the car. And there had just been a story on the radio about somebody who, uh, a teenager was sharing the worst day of their life. And my daughter said, well, don't you know mine? You know, I used to live in fear of what my daughter would say in therapy one day. And I was about to find out. So I said, no, honey, what, what was the worst day of your life? From the back seat, I could feel her barrowing, you know, like in the back of my skull. And she said, Ma, don't you remember? Back at our house on Desert Wind when I came home from school? And I couldn't find you. And I looked and I looked, Ma, Ma, wake up. You were like asleep in bed. What is that? Wake up. Mom, Ma. Mom, and my daughter was afraid that I never would wake up. And sometimes when your sugar goes really low, your liver kicks in and you're back. Liver gives you sugar and you're back. And I remember I'm coming back and I open my eyes and the neighbors are there. The paramedics are there. They're all having a party at my house. And everybody's looking at me white as a sheet. It was extraordinary. And I thought, oh, thank God I was wearing something. <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. 
And I remember thinking, you know, so often we can't do things for ourselves, but we've just got to do them for other people because it just doesn't affect us. How we, whatever you're dealing with, what you're dealing with also affects all the people around you. I've scared my daughter. I frightened myself. I've got ex-boyfriends who could tell such embarrassing stories. But I kept on searching because I knew there had to be a better way. There had to be a better way. And for me, where is it? Aha! For me, that better way was an insulin pump. And I carry a three-day supply of insulin. And here's the thing. You don't have to know what can help you feel better. You may not know. You may go on the internet and look. A friend may find out for you. And that's what happened for me. A friend was in Mexico, and she saw a woman on the beach wearing a bikini, holding a margarita, and wearing an insulin pump. I think, hey, a woman wearing a bikini on the beach, good for her. Never mind wearing an insulin pump. And my friend said, that's either a pump or she is wearing a pager on the beach. So she went up to her and she said, you know, what is that? And tell me all about it. And she told her she felt better the first day she went on it. So we were like, okay. She practically ran back to tell me. And I thought, well, I don't know. I need to see. I need to do some research. Is that what I want? I'm not sure. I was all kerfuffled. And she is very calm. And she just looked at me and said, yeah. <laughs> because I was blaming myself. I thought, I can do this. I really don't. So I got the pump, and I can't tell you, I take half the amount of insulin that I used to take, and all you do is you have a three-day supply in here, and there's a lot of different kinds of pumps, and I want to show you, though, I want to pass around just so you can get an idea of just how little, and afterwards I'll show you what the syringe is like, ee, ee. Well, the pump looks like this. This is all that's in you, is a little teeny baby tube. Yeah, please, pass those around so they can look at it. Because you can't believe it. If I had this on a slide, you wouldn't believe it. You need to see the nothing that this is. Because I thought a needle was in you all the time, and it's not. And I thought, I don't want that thing to control me. But it's the key to my freedom. Okay? And there's even people afterwards that can tell you about pumps and show you all the cool different kinds. I am so grateful to that very scary day, I am so grateful. Because in that day, I saw, that was like the wake up call. I saw the ramifications to myself and my little booby. What happens if I don't take care of myself? And you know, whether you have type one or type two, the pump is if you're using insulin shots. And the other thing you can do is always know what your sugar's doing. Look, this is gonna be show and tell, ready? This is a cool gizmo that lets you know it's a 24-hour glucose meter, right? And this is one that has a really cool little, looks like a little iPod thing that goes with it that tells you what your sugar is. And this one, just to kind of give you the full show and tell, you don't wear both of them at the same time. I'm just trying to give you an idea. This one talks to the pump. So there's so many different ways you can do it, you know? And the thing is, I'll never forget, you know, there's a lot of education with some of this stuff. The meter's pretty easy, they can show you. And I know for me, the other day, I kept hearing a beep. It's like having a Jewish mother attached to you all the time. <laughs> Except that it has a silent mode and I don't. <laughs> And I'll never forget when I first started talking about the pump because I just felt so good about it. And um, what do you think the question is that people ask when they find out that I have an insulin pump? It's an embarrassing question they're afraid to ask. Any suggestions? <laughs> how do you, as a plant in the audience, how do you have sex? Absolutely, because that's what people want to know because they want to know, well, you're kind of wearing that on you. Is that a problem? It's not a problem. In fact, I say, well, it depends. What kind of sex do you want to have? If you want to have the short, lovely sort of sex, you just disconnect, set it on the nightstand, have a great time. But if you, just like when you take a shower, but if you want to have the long, luscious, last for hours, wake up, go at it again sort of sex, then you order the pump with the really long tubing. Because I don't know about you, I'm a lot more fun when I feel good. And you don't have to worry about it. It's not that delicate. If my husband rolls over on it, I'm like, honey, give me that back. Woo. And you can hide it in my knee sock. There's even a pump without 
tubes, whatever you want. There's so much variety now. There are so many solutions. Whether you've got type 1 or type 2, it doesn't matter. I just want everyone to know there's hope, and it's not impossible. It's not impossible to walk past the bakery. It's not impossible to have one in one instead of three. And you can skip the super size. It's not impossible. It happens every day, no matter what you say. And I like to say, my gut will never do what I want it to. Go away. Because I want everyone to know that there's hope. There really, really is. And I have never again, in the 17 years that I've been on the pump, I have never had another low, go unconscious, can't remember where I am blood sugar again. And I just want everyone to know, no matter what you're dealing with, whether it's diabetes or not, type 1, type 2, pre-diabetes, there's so much we can do. There's information at itsasweetlifenow.com. There's tons of great free stuff so you can get whatever you need so you can feel good. Because diabetes isn't hard for a day or a week, but it's day in and day out that can get really tricky. All together, shout it now. There's no one who can doubt it now. So let's tell the world about it now. Happy days, happy nights, happy days are here again. Thank you.